Welcome to Uxbridge Skugog Life. I'm your host, Jackie Hermans. So I have some exciting news to share. TSC, the shopping channel, has been celebrating Elizabeth Grant's 100th birthday. And if you don't know Elizabeth Grant, it is their number one skincare beauty line. And uh, to celebrate the birthday, they have been giving away some beautiful baskets with uh, Elizabeth Grant skincare products. I was one of the recipients of one of these baskets and you could be too. So I want you to stay tuned because in the very near, near future, we're gonna let you know how you will have the potential of winning one of these skincare baskets. Now, on with the show. So we're gonna be talking to uh, Dr. Carly Jensen, the name kind of went away for just a second, but I'm back. So Dr. Carly Jensen, and we're going to be talking about the difference between cardiac arrest, heart failure, and, and heart attack. We're also going to be having the region of Durham paramedics on the show and giving us a demonstration of how you will be able to save lives through the use of CPR. So stay tuned for all of that. So we will be back with more on Oxford Skugog Life. Make sure you keep watching. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Sometimes for a wish to come true. It takes a kingdom, because together we're stronger. Tied tight, united we stand, in honor of one child's wish, to fuel the fire that will grant many more. Join the kingdom. I'm Judith Tate, host and producer of At The Heart of Business. Join me each week as we get to know women in business and learn all about their challenges and successes. That's At The Heart of Business right here on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Oxford Skugog Live. So with me on the show is Dr. Carly Jensen, who is the chief of the Uxbridge site, Oak Valley Health. And today we're gonna to be talking about the differences between cardiac arrest, heart failure, and heart attack. And what we're gonna start with is, what is cardiac arrest? So cardiac arrest basically describes when the heart stops moving. And so there's lots of different things that can happen to cause that to occur. But typically when we say cardiac arrest, we mean that the heart is no longer working as a pump. It's no longer functioning to sort of pump the body with full of blood. So that would be a cardiac arrest. So what are the signs of cardiac arrest? Yeah, if you have a cardiac arrest, like a full arrest, so your heart has stopped movement, like you're gonna be unconscious. You're, you're essentially, you're dead. Like your, your, your heart is not beating. So we would call that vital signs absence. The person is going to collapse. They're not gonna be able to answer questions. They might have some adrenal breathing because there's certain things that will happen within the body that will trigger breathing. So someone might look like they're breathing, but they won't be able to respond to you. They won't um, uh, be able to answer questions. They won't be able to push you off if you were to start CPR. So that would be what you'd be looking for, an unconscious person. So what is a heart attack then? Okay, so a heart attack, and this is um, a lot of times people mix up these. So I'm glad you're asking these differences. They, they mix up these different terms. Um, so a heart attack is basically when the heart as a muscle is not getting enough blood flow. So like every muscle in your body, that muscle needs blood flow. That's sort of like your gas needs engine, to, like your, or sorry, your engine <laughs> needs gas to run. So similarly, the muscle, the pumping action of your heart, it requires the blood flow. If that blood flow is blocked because of a clogged artery, usually because of either high cholesterol or smoking history or high blood pressure or family history, if you're not getting enough blood flow to that heart muscle, that muscle's gonna 
not get uh, any blood flow. It's going to be painful. So people will have crushing chest pain. And then if it's not getting enough blood flow in a really serious way, it will stall out. Okay. And then you have a cardiac arrest. So a heart attack can cause a cardiac arrest if they're not getting enough blood flow to the heart muscle to a large enough extent that it can't pump anymore. Most of the time though, it will still pump. Like if they're not, if it's just getting not quite enough, but it will still sort of sputter and work. That's where people will get chest pain, but they'll still be able to tell you, oh, I'm having chest pain in this moment. And that would be a, you know, a trigger to go to the eMERGE call 911. So then a sign would be chest pain. Yeah, so ch most people get chest pain, but not everybody. Some people might just have shortness of breath. Some people might have nausea. I've had someone who had shoulder pain. I've had someone who's had, neck pain. Uh, women don't always follow all the rules with regards to, you know, typical presentations. And so a woman who comes in basically with any symptom between here and here, I keep it in my mind that maybe this is a heart related issue. But by far, the most common would be discomfort in the chest. And it's not always pain. In fact, I have people sometimes correct me. No, no, it's not really pain. It's just a heaviness or it's just a weight or shortness of breath, shortness of breath, chest pain, sweatiness, those would all be worrisome sort of symptoms for me. So what is heart failure then? Okay, so heart failure is generally not a single event, but more that the engine, that heart, that pumping action is just not starting to work very well. So imagine the heart as a muscle and it's constantly beating, right? So let's say a section of that is no longer beating properly because you had a heart attack several years ago. So that muscle, at the time of the heart attack, didn't get enough blood flow and part of that muscle tissue died off and now it's just scar tissue. Scar tissue won't be able to contract in the same way. If you have enough heart attacks, then what happens is, is there's not enough heart muscle that's actively working and the pump will start to fail. The pumping action of the heart will start to get more sluggish and it won't be able to circulate the blood as well as it did previously. And so that's how we term heart failure. Um, suggesting that it's just failing to do its job. So think of like a like a sump pump in your basement that can't keep up with uh, the flow in. So in those scenarios with heart failure, one of the more common things we do is we try and offload the pressure of the heart. We're trying to make it really easy for the heart so it doesn't have to work very hard at pumping. So we want to make sure your blood pressure isn't high. We want to make sure you don't have extra fluid on board. So we give diuretics and things like that. Um, but yeah, heart failure isn't so much as a, of an acute event and Sometimes it can be, but more often than not, it's something that happens on a more chronic basis. So what are the signs of heart failure? With that, typically it would happen in someone who has a history of a heart problem in the past. So someone who's had multiple heart attacks may over time start to notice that they have shortness of breath when they go up a flight of stairs, or if they're trying to lie flat at night, they might start to notice some shortness of breath in the um, in that lying flat position. And the main reason for that is actually the first place that backs up is the lungs. So remember I said your heart is like a pump and I used the example of the sump pump in your basement. So the first place the fluid builds up is in the basement if your sump pump starts to fail. So similarly, if the heart pump starts to fail, the first place it starts to backlog is generally in the lungs. Um, and so that's why people will feel short of breath if they're um, lying flat at night, because when you're lying flat, the fluid sort of builds up a little bit in your lungs. There might be a little bit of fluid buildup in the ankles as well, or even just generalized weight gain. For, so if I have a patient who, I, who has heart failure and they suddenly gain five pounds, that's not a cheesecake effect. That's usually a heart failure effect, meaning that they've retained some fluid and all I need to do is give them a diuretic to help them pee that extra fluid off and that weight gain goes away. So what happened to Buffalo Bill's Damar Hamlin in Cincinnati and how critical were the nine minutes for him on that field? I can't understate how important those nine minutes were. So in those moments, his heart was not beating. So because the heart was not beating, that was a cardiac arrest. His heart was not beating. He was not circulating blood flow anywhere in his body, including his brain. Your brain does not do well without blood flow. Uh, a lot of your other organs, if they briefly don't have blood flow, they'll, they'll be okay. Sort of like not watering your plants, they'll be okay for a little bit. Your brain tissue, if it goes without blood flow for any extended period of time, that's when brain damage happens. And so what CPR, you're basically taking over the action of the pump, you're 
you're pushing the heart, so you're squeezing it in between the sternum and the and the back, um, so your backbone, the spine there, you're squeezing that heart, so you're creating that pumping function. And if they're lying flat, you don't need to create a lot of pressure because you're not pumping uphill because they're lying flat. His brain would have had circulation. There's no mouth to mouth required. This is the thing that makes people really worried about CPR. We now know actually just good quality CPR is all you need. So if you ever come across somebody who is unconscious and you're at all worried about them, don't stand back and say, oh, should I, should I not? Or are they just, un you know, just drunk or are they just unconscious for another reason? You are always good to go and, you know, make sure the place is safe for yourself, but then ask if they're okay. If you do not hear them respond, start CPR. You, if, if they're awake, they'll push you off very quickly. Um, cause it, cause time is brain tissue and time is heart tissue. So he had a very specific type of cardiac arrest. Um, that's very treatable with CPR and then something called defibrillation, which is basically like rebooting the heart because he had an electrical problem with his heart. It was electric sort of the way that the electricity conducts through the heart. That was the problem in his scenario, which is a rare scenario, but it does happen. So how lucky is he to actually be alive today? Well, I, I, I guess I'd say he's quite lucky, but at the same time, he also um, had it occur in a place where people are well-trained to deal with this. So I don't want to say it's all luck. Like, I think this is like massive kudos to the team that looked after him who trained for these sorts of things. And I remember thinking in the moment, because I was actually watching it with my sons um, and the event happened and they were showing it on replay and they were asking me, what do I think happened? And actually I, I did call it. I said, oh, I, I think I know what this is. It's a, a blow to the chest that can cause a problem. Um, I remember thinking like, how are they gonna do quality CPR through the breastplate that that they wear there? Because I, I think you'd have a hard time getting it, but they must have trained this and in fact, that's what I've, I've read since is that they do train these scenarios quickly getting the shears out, cutting off that breastplate so they can actually get good contact and do proper CPR. And, it, and then that's what saved his life. Dr. Carly Jensen, thank you so much for being on the show. We will be right back with more on Oxford School Gog Life. Canadian jokes, sir? I mean, I know you're the instructor and everything, but we can't carry the ball. How can we get a decent shot at the uh, peach basket? <laughs> All right. Maybe we can allow a carry of a couple of steps. And hey, Mr. Naismith, sir, it sure slows things down having to climb up here every time. Well, then let's cut the bottom out of the basket. Ah, but I need these baskets back. hundred years after James Naismith from Almont, Ontario invented it, basketball was being played by hundreds of millions of people around the world. Welcome back to Oxford Scugog Life. So now with me on the show, Region of Durham Paramedics, we have Nicole Gilchrist, and we also have Brock Botticheski. I said it right. You did, it's yes. a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> now Nicole, you have been, been a paramedic for over 20 years, and Brock, you have been a paramedic for about 16 years. That's right. Approximately partners and now within the same like team and everything for about five years now. Correct. So get, can you give our community of Uxbridge Scugog uh, Life viewers an idea of like what department are you in right now? What are you guys uh, What are you guys in a pair of doing at this time? We're in the training department. Yes, training division. Okay. So we do paramedic education, continuing education, as well as we also do some education within the community. Um, we speak with school-aged children, um, we promote our profession, as well as we talk to seniors groups. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm really glad to have you on the show. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, heart attacks, heart failure, cardiac mm -hmm. arrest, it happens. Yes. And um, the more people who are educated as to how to help people, should they um, go into cardiac arrest, etc. 
uh, the better. We can we can help each other to save lives, which yes. is yeah. what you guys are passionate about. Public public education's the big the kink here that needs to be. Yeah. Um, promoted. Promoted, yeah. Early access to defib and training and everyone should know how to do CPR. Right. Okay, so there's lots of places that people can go to get training. That's the most important thing mm -hmm. is encouraging people to get their own training. Yes. So Heart and Stroke Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, Red Cross, mm -hmm. uh, St. John's Ambulance. I'm, I'm, yes. There's more out there, but I'll just met the, mention those ones right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, but today I think it would be really important to give people at least a little demo. So if they're not trained yet, here are the basics just to help someone should it happen, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Nicole, you wanted to say something. No, out in the community as well, um, if you encounter somebody that has what you I th believe is a sudden cardiac arrest, in the community you can look for the symbol that might be located on a door or a window of the building that might tell you that there is a public access defib. Most establishments, whether it be sporting facilities, malls, shopping centers, stores, doctor's offices, they will all have public access defib. Okay, and also known as an AED. What, do, what does an AED stand for? Automatic external defibrillator. We okay. don't, sorry, we don't use that term <laughs> okay. all that often. Okay, yeah. Because we have a defibrillator that looks a lot different than okay. what the public might use. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but the system that would be in an AD at a public setting, like an arena, yeah. um, they're super simple. Okay. Right? They're buttons you press and you follow the prompts. You can't hurt them. If you think that they're in a cardiac arrest, yeah. not doing something is hurting is them. Is hurting them. Absolutely. Okay, and normally they're in a box on the wall, yep. yes. right? Sometimes they're bright yellow, mm -hmm. or sometimes I think it's they're just, white it's too. It's a white but box. A yeah. white box, okay. So all you have to do is you open up the window, you pull Take the device out. out. Sometimes you'll hear an alarm sound. Right. Okay. Sometimes you'll hear it say that it's calling 911. But as we always tell everybody within, you know, public education, don't assume that they're calling 911. Activate call. the 911 right. system right away. Okay. So, so if there's more, oh, I'm so sorry, Nicole. No, Say call, call 911 on your cell yeah. phone. And the biggest thing is put your cell phone on speaker okay. so that you can place the phone beside the patient. You can um, follow the prompts from the dispatcher and they can hear what's going on. Okay. So the very first thing, call 911. Mm -hmm. If there's other people around, then maybe you can send them to find, I was gonna say AED, cause it's just in my That's brain. Okay. That's how I normally say it. What, what did you call this again? You you have your own term. And a public access defib is okay, probably the easiest you. term. Or an AED, yeah. Okay, yeah. beautiful. So yeah. if you have other bystanders, you know, you can start CPR, yeah. you can activate the 911 system, okay. as well as you can call for a bystander, hey, you, can you go in and call 911 or can you go to the front door to wait for the paramedics or the fire department or police to arrive on right. the scene to direct them to where we are. Okay, so in, during the next segment on the show, you're mm -hmm. gonna give us a demo of the basics of what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand we're not even encouraging mouth to mouth at this point. Right? No, the, the transition over the last several years now has been good quality CPR okay. and limiting hands-off time. And okay. that's where if we focus too much on delivering breaths, then we're taking our hands off the chest and we're not pumping their heart for them. Okay. Which is what happens in cardiac arrest. Your heart's not doing anything that it's supposed to be doing. Okay, so we're going to talk about that more and we're going to do the demo in the next uh, segment. So we'll be right back with more on Oxford Scugog Life. symptom of bladder cancer. Don't ignore this warning sign. Not even once. Community ultimately yeah. is always the people you surround yourself with. If I ever leave this area, I'm never going to forget these these country river nights. Allowing people from outside of the area and in the area uh, experience farm life, experience art. Wawana, take care. 
to miigwatch. Thank you very much. Kuwabin. See you later. Welcome back to Oxford Skugog Life. So I have from the region of Durham paramedics, I have Nicole and Brock, and you guys are about to do a demonstration to help to save lives. So should someone have heart failure, cardiac arrest, this is what you can do. So we were talking about, first of all, you need to call 911. You're looking for, um, I keep the automatic de defibrillator. Yep. I keep on saying AED. AED that's yeah, okay. Yeah, interchangeable. And uh, so now you're going to give us a demo of what to do. So you have the AED, and I see that you have some gloves on. So normally the gloves are within the kit. So housed within the public access defib box. Normally when you pull the device out, it has like a little pouch that would have some personal protective equipment. So being your gloves, it may also have a little towelette to dry the chest off, as well as a razor. So if somebody like a gentleman has, you know, a really hairy chest, you need to shave the chest a bit so that there's good pad contact with the skin. So if it's a woman and they have an underwire bra, is it mm -hmm. also important to cut that? Yes, yeah, so there's a, yeah. also a pair of scissors okay. um, inside the kit and you can cut the bra. Okay. Or if it's like a V-neck sweater and you, you need to get the actual pads on the patient, unfortunately in the public at that time it's an emergency, you, you still have to you know, expose the chest. Okay, do we need to worry about nipple piercings or things like that? To no, do those? well, you do in the sense that you don't want the actual defib pads right. touching. To be on them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So whether or not that be um, a medi medication patch that might be on the patient's chest, yeah. or sometimes if they have an, a um, pacemaker. pacemaker, you just want to make sure the pads don't place over top of those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have to remove a medication patch, just take it off and you can wipe it off with the gauze pad that's in the kit. Okay, beautiful. So show mm -hmm. us. Show okay. <laughs> okay, so um, we've got a training device here, so it's not going to be exactly the same. Okay. But uh, when Nicole opens it up, this is what it will essentially look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have one demo pad that would show you guys what it would look like. It's like a gel uh, backing so that it sticks onto the patient really, really well. Okay. So you're placing, you're aiming to place this in the center of the chest, this in the r right upper chest, and this will place down at the side of the patient, at the side of the chest. Okay. So it's kind of like a landmark for you mm -hmm. to where to put the heel of your hand. So you put the heel of your one hand there, you place your other hand over top, you're kneeling right down beside the patient, your elbows are locked, and then you're pushing down. Okay, great. So your wrists are directly be below your shoulders? Right. Yes. Yeah. And you can use your gravity from your chest. Yes. If you have a tempo to hit, you yeah. could sing that song, Staying Alive. Okay. There's other songs that have the same rate, but that gives you an idea of how quickly you should be moving because the compression ratio should be around 100 to 120 a minute. Okay. Most people wouldn't understand how to do that, so that's why they have the song in their head, singing the song. Okay. Which I don't want to do on TV right now. <laughs> oh, come on. But, ah, ah, ah. Um, right, staying gotcha. Alive. And yeah. it's also okay to go faster than that because I've also heard ba the song Baby Shark. Yes. So you yeah, can do that right. faster that if you happen to know that song. Yep. The Baby other Shark, thing yeah. is the device, once the device turns on, most times when you lift the lid of the device, it okay. will automatically start operating and it will give you verbal prompts. Okay. When you start your compressions, it's also going to give you a beep, beep, beep sound okay. and that's kind of the tempo that you want to keep up with with okay. your compressions. Now in the machines that I've used before it has it has given you a moment to take the time to breathe. Yes. So at this point if you're not wanting to do that you don't feel comfortable doing that you just ignore that and, and then start compressions and again. And just keep doing compressions. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Continuous compressions, center of the chest, push and repeat. Okay, yeah. and if this is a tiresome, like mm -hmm. very physical type of thing, mm -hmm. so you can even trade off if, if anyone else is Absolutely. there and if they know mm -hmm. how to do it, then yes. you can uh, go back and forth. So normally what we say is that if you're by yourself, you're doing compressions until you can no longer physically do compressions, 
or until the patient exhibits signs of life. Okay, so if or until? If they open their eyes up and they talk to you or until another first responder arrives. Okay, mm -hmm. beautiful, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. So above mm -hmm. all, go get yourself trained. That's right. Yes. So go take CPR and first aid as well. Like doesn't That's have to right. be just that we, mm -hmm. it's beneficial for everyone. And these okay. are so user friendly. They'll, yeah. they will walk you through all the steps. Yeah, is it okay Beautiful. if we show you what that looks like? We actually need to wrap up now. We're oh, gonna okay. have to have you back on the show. That's okay. all right, we okay. can do that. Okay, so thank you so much. We'll be back with more on Oxford Scugog Life. I'll be there. Hey folks, it's the BMD here. Don't forget to tune into my next episode of Meet the Band on the Rogers Television Network when we have LSD on Lucid Smog Disorder. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Daryl. And I'm Julie. We're the hosts of the Mind Mind Mental Health Show presented by Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences. Each episode, we get the conversation going by talking with experts and people impacted by mental illness. Join the conversation with Mind Mind. Only on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Oxford Scugog Live. So we're wrapping up the show and we invited Nicole and Brock to stay just to give us a quick demo of how this is gonna work. Right, so we've opened the kit, we've got our pads on, Unit okay. we've turned it on, and we're Get following the prompts. Are Air they awake? Help. Have we called 911? Open airway. Open airway, we're not overly focused at this point of the game. Unless you've already been trained, right? right? Yep. Okay. Don't touch patients. So now we're just following what they want. Don't touch them. It's uh, interpreting what's on the... Don't touch patient. Analyzing. In what's happening inside the heart right now. Okay. Just to see shock if advised. there's a chance that this could help. Don't so we have 20 patient. seconds left here. Press flashing shock button. Shock delivered. Start CPR. And after we shock, it's going to tell you what to do. Go back on the chest, follow the prompts. It's going to hit a higher speed in the metronome and follow along. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you much. Thank you so much for joining. We'll be back next week with more on Oxford Scugog Life. Response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. It's so convenient to grab a carton of milk. It took over 60 years to get to this point. It sounds odd, but if you didn't have a cow in the early 1900s, you'd rely on a family farm. The Weary family farm was one of the contributors to the production and distribution of our favorite cookie companion via scoop and pail or by bottle. Then, in the 1930s, with the demand for pasteurized milk, the Weary family partnered with 10 local farmers 